Good afternoon, everybody. We're, uh, we're glad you're here uh, at the end of the semester, joining us for the last of our, our talks in our uh, Future of uh, Scholarly Publishing series this year here at, uh, at the libraries. Uh, the, the entire series has been uh, sponsored by the Mellon Foundation, so we are, um, as always, very grateful to, uh, for their support. Uh, my name is Brian Croxell. I'm one of uh, the digital humanities librarians here, and I have the pleasure of introducing Curtis Fletcher today. Uh, Curtis is the Associate Director of the Polymathic Labs at USC Sydney Harmon Academy for Polymathic Study, which is uh, a lot to say. Uh, uh, he received his PhD in History from University of Southern California and a uh, Bachelor's in History and Philosophy from Berkeley. His research spans the history of technology, the history of humanities, education, science and technology studies, and visual studies. He specializes in digital research and writing the humanities with particular expertise in new models for authoring, credentialing, and publishing born digital and multimodal humanities scholarship. He is uh, currently co-PI on a, a digital humanities implementation grant awarded by the NEH um, for uh, editorial and review workflow in Scalar, uh, which is what he's going to be talking in part about today. And I can say just as, as by way of a personal anecdote, last summer I had a chance to um, be at a workshop at Middlebury uh, where Curtis was there and we were um, talking with a number of different faculty about uh, the ideas they had for digital uh, publications. And there were a couple of us who were brought in sort of to consult and there were some faculty there and we got paired up with people. And it was striking how much Curtis was able to get done in one day, how bad I felt about how little I, you know, I'd gotten with my faculty member. Um, so Curtis, Curtis knows a lot about the subject. He's been thinking about it for a long time, and so we're really um, glad to have him here. And please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And thank you for having me. I've, uh, <coughs> had, this is my first time at Brown, um, and it, it's wonderful. I've always wanted to come. Um, there's a way in which Brown is actually, I think, very integral in the kind of trajectory of digital scholarship and digital humanities. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, well, digital humanities began back in, you know, the 1950s with sort of literary data processing, but of course that's literary data processing. Digital humanities didn't really um, uh, evolve or emerge until more recently. A lot of people think that that happened sort of in the early 90s at UVA. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably the case that it began here at Brown in the mid-80s with Intermedia and even earlier in the mid-70s with the hypertext experiments that some of you may have been a part of. Um, yeah, so back in the, back in the 70s, uh, hypertext experiments with poetry um, and other humanities classes, which all led directly up to the sort of hypermedia, you know, um, archives of the late 80s, which then became, I think, the kind of digital archives of the 90s that UVA was responsible for. So I think that Brown is actually really ahead <laughs> or sort of behind um, in a lot of that stuff. Um, so it's kind of like coming back to the mothership, <laughs> is what I want to say. So, okay, here's what I want to do today. Um, I want to talk a bit about the overall aims and kind of history of the Alliance for Networking and Visual Culture, <coughs> and Scalar in particular. Um, and then I want to talk about the sort of affordances that were built into Scalar given those overall aims and that history. And then I want to show some sort of use cases, right? The sort of um, most compelling examples or genres of scholarly communication um, that we've kind of identified uh, that are well suited to, to Scalar. Um, and then I think I'll end with a brief bit about future and current development, some of which I think uh, may dovetail with some of the efforts going on here in terms of um, digital publications. So. So <clears throat> the Scalar team really emerged out of a series of efforts around a journal called Vectors. Curious if anyone here has heard of Vectors. More than usual, far more than usual. Okay, so Vector is a journal, is a journal, sorry, published at USC. It's published sort of um, periodically now. Uh, it's heyday was kind of during 2005, 2008. That's when it was sort of published regularly. Um, and the idea was to create truly experimental kind of multimodal interactive humanities scholarship, largely humanities scholarship. So the pieces in Vectors are were built largely in Flash, 
They were custom designed. They were interactive. They were haptic, right? They were built in a way that, in which the sort of argument in these, what are essentially essays, kind of unfolded via the user interaction, right? Sometimes frustratingly so, right? So for instance, <clears throat> this piece here um, was about the kind of protocols of traditional knowledge and archiving. And what the user came to find throughout their interaction was that they did not have access to a lot of these because, well, this person is deceased. And according to this culture, you aren't supposed to be able to see them, right? Um, if a person were viewing this piece in a particular season, they might not be able to see certain images or watch certain videos. So the argument, oh, well, it acted both as a kind of archive and as an argument-driven essay, but that argument didn't become clear until the user kind of interacted with it in various ways. Okay. So the model in vectors was this. Scholars would apply, scholars would come in to USC, and scholars would, for a month, work intensively with an information design director, a <coughs> graphic designer, a creative director, basically a, a technologist and an artist and a humanist would get together and try and put these pieces together, right? After a month of intensive study, they would go their own way, and over the next six months or so, they would build one of these pieces. And six months later, and probably $30,000 later, you would get this beautiful, beautiful, flash-driven, interactive humanities essay, right? So a lot was learned about what it is the scholars wanted. If they were given every affordance, every digital affordance in the world, what they would want to build and what they would want to do. But it certainly wasn't scalable, right? And it wasn't sustainable. Um, it wasn't sustainable because you have to get funding each summer to do this, whether it's from the NEH or someone else. It wasn't scalable because you could only reach so many scholars, right? So the idea was, how does one go about templatizing, right, the sorts of lessons learned, working with scholars in depth over a summer to try to build these kind of experimental digital humanities essays? And from there came Scalar. And in fact, there's an inside joke here. Um, and I never know what I mean when I say this, but apparently mathematically, scalars are how you scale vectors. Anyone know what that means? Yes. Okay, so someone knows. Right. But in any case, that's the inside <laughs> joke from our information design director. So from vectors, you get scalars. So scalar is the way to scale that out, right? So scalar was born out of two contexts. The first was the context that I just told you, right? Um, what is it the scholars want to do in the digital world if they could give anything that they want? The second was the formation of the Alliance for Networking Visual Culture, which was a set of partnerships between digital archives and archivists, humanity centers working in digital modalities, and academic presses who were interested in publishing these sorts of works. So Scalar kind of sits at the center of those sets of relationships. Um, as a kind of technical hub. And the sort of concerns and issues from each of those stakeholders are built into the platform, right? So it was a way of trying to figure out, it became clear pretty early on that the only way to truly get, you know, digital scholarship adopted at a larger scale was not just to give scholars access to these affordances, but also that we would have to kind of do it in lockstep together us, the humanities scholars, the presses, the archives, everyone. So Scalar is a way to try and build those concerns in and move everyone online together. And you'll see some of what I mean about that um, later on. Okay. So what were those affordances? What ultimately got built into Scalar? Well, let me just go over a couple. Um, one of the things that we noticed was that in the digital world, scholars wanted to be able to attend to their sources and their media with more detail than they, than they could in ink print, right? So in other words, they, it isn't just that they wanted to get a lot more media onto the page, right, and a particular film onto the page, but they also wanted to be able to attend to it at a more granular level and comment on that media, right? 
So this is a late antiquarian text as part of a digital edition that should be coming out soon. Um, and what they've done is they, they digitized, um, they scanned and digitized uh, all the pages in really high resolution, put them into scale. And then on the more graphical pages, they've actually annotated each and every section to kind of um, translate what's going on. Um, this is a montage about, um, it's an essay from an essay called Chaos and Control by Steve Anderson uh, that was actually published in uh, American Literature. And this is a montage that he put together of different clips from the, from the 50s and 60s about kind of punch card chaos, right? Um, the way in which computers just sort of, you know, go on the fritz in all these movies, right? Remember the one where it was like desktop? Okay, um, so he created a montage and then he annotated it so that at the beginning of each clip or each part of the montage, um, the new commentary pops out. So you get the sort of running commentary, right? Um, that doesn't necessarily belong in the body of the text, right? It's something that more properly, if it can, and in the digital world it can, lives more adjacent to the media itself. Scholars also wanted to be directly connected to archives that they were working with. But the archivists that we were working with and the archives we were working with also wanted this. So one of the things that Scalar allows you to do, and this is in particular the Omeka importer, um, it allows you to, without leaving the authoring interface, just grab media from various assets, whether it's the Getty or Internet Archive or Critical Commons, without ever leaving, and just plop that material right down into your project um, and then add it into your project. Um, so the idea was that by doing this, Scalar would help close the gap between the scholarship and the archives from which that scholarship kind of emerged. <coughs> In terms of structure, what we noticed is scholars wanted to do a couple of things. They wanted to be able to create pathways through the material, right? Sounds familiar, right? They want to create narratives. They want to create mini narratives, right? So we built in what are what we call paths, right? They also wanted to group material as, you know, under a common heading or as related. So we built in a tagging function. But because we didn't actually know exactly what scholars would ultimately want to do with this platform, we built in what you might call a kind of flat ontology. So we have paths and we have tags and we have annotations and we have media and we have pages. In Scalar, those things are totally equivalent, right? So uh, for those of you who use other platforms like WordPress, um, you know that there are sort of there there are many different elements to a WordPress site, but they're not really equivalent, right? Posts aren't the same thing as pages. You can't really edit a post the same way that you can. You can't put a post into a main table of contents, right? Um, when you have a piece of media, it really only exists in reference to the page that it's on. In Scalar, everything is equivalent, right? Which means that you can do anything you want to anything else. So not only can you have multiple paths that share material. But that material can also be a path, or that material can also be a tag, or that material can also be an annotation, right? So you can annotate media, and then you could tag all of those annotations to some other page, and you could put that page in a path, right? And the idea was we wanted to build in as much flexibility as possible because, you know, we had some sense of what it is the scholars wanted to do, given these intensive study, given this, you know, these intensive workshops with them. Um, but there is a way in which that was, I don't know, an artificial environment. It was kind of a, a, you know, it was more like a laboratory than anything else. In other words, <coughs> these are the ideas the scholars emerged with while working with technologists and artists, right? So we don't necessarily know that that's what they're going to want to do. So we wanted to build in total flexibility, right? And this is the way that we did it. We also wanted to be kind of bringing kind of agnostic to the media that can be imported. And we did this for a couple of reasons. So these are, so obviously you can, you know, you can import video and you can import images and you can um, import audio, that sort of thing. Um, but we also allow you to import Anything that will play nice with an iframe, basically anything on the web can be imported as a media object and put into your media library, put on a page, tagged, 
right? Um, and you can build any relationship you want between it and other elements. So these are 3D objects. Now, Scalar does actually natively now support STL and OBJ files, so some uh, 3D objects. But this is not one of those. This is actually a 3D object um, from a player outside in the World Wide Web somewhere out in the wild. And they just uh, imported that as a media object, right? Um, and this was done before we even supported 3D objects. And the idea is that, you know, that way we don't have to kind of keep ahead. We don't know what it is that's going to be the next compelling object of analysis for scholars, right? Three years ago, it wasn't 3D objects, and now it is, right? So we wanted to build that kind of flexibility in as well. And I'll also say that I think it's important because not only is, you know, what a compelling digital object of analysis is, is it, it, not only is that a moving target and you don't know what people are going to want to use, but it's also the case that I think the things that we're using online will at some point become the things that we're critiquing and talking about. We want Scalar to be able to do that too, right? So not only can you embed a, you know, I don't know, uh, a neat line map because it does something that Scalar won't do, but you can also embed a neat line map because you might want to critique how neat line maps are used. Okay, and then the last thing I'll say about affordances is, is this. Given that there were all of these kind of rich relationships that you build up in Scalar, we wanted to make all of that as legible as possible, right? Um, and this is something that, you know, this isn't just, this wasn't just something that we had to come to terms with. Um, this is something that in all sort of hypertextual scholarship, um, this becomes a kind of friction point. Right? We see this even, even with early hypertext systems. If you read reviews of these things, it's always, I kind of have some sense of where I can go next, but I have no sense of the global structure of this project. Right? And as a reader, we kind of want to know that. Usually what we do is we flip between the page that we're on and the table of contents or the index and we get a sense of where we are. Right? In the digital world, that kind of large scale global structure also I think needs to be legible especially in a platform like Scalar, where basically what you're doing is building up relationships between elements in a project, right? Okay, so um, this visualization is always accessible for a reader. Let me just go up to that compass right there. And so what I want to point out is that this is, they're viewing all media. So here's what the reader sees. Uh, so there's like 12 pieces of media in this project. And this piece of media is on this page. So again, everything you do in Scalar is a relationship. If I put a piece of media on a page, that's a relationship in the database, right? If I annotate a piece of media, that's a relationship in the database. So this media resides on this page, and it has an annotation. And this, annotate, this piece of media has two annotations. And that annotation actually has a piece of media in it. So again, in terms of that flexibility, annotations are their own things. So you can put pages in an annotation. You can put media in an annotation. You can put an annotation in an annotation. And of course, at a larger scale, Right, not just looking at all media, but looking at all content. It's fairly easy to get a sense of the overall picture of the project. So this is a path called Chapter One, and these are all the media objects that they have tagged with that particular tag. But of course, this can get pretty unwieldy pretty quickly, right? And so this is where support kind of comes in. So the ability to build up relationships when you're writing, as you're writing in Scalar, is both um, an affordance and a challenge, right? Which is to say, when you're supporting scholars who are doing this kind of scholarship, you need to make sure that they attend to both levels, right? What's going on at the page and what's going on at the global level, right? Because things can get pretty illegible pretty quickly. So, it might be that a scholar wants to build a path about some topic, right? So that when a reader is on that path, they're kind of going along the topic. But they also, this is something you have to continually, you know, continually insist on, um, they need to know that that path shows up here, right? That they are building a database as they're building a narrative, right? And the question is, does that path or those relationships, while good on, at the page level, right, do they muddy this visualization? Do they muddy some overall global sense of the project? Right. Okay. 
So what is scalar? So very specifically, scalar is a semantic web authoring and publishing platform that's meant to do a couple of things, right? It's, as you've already heard, it's meant for scholarship that is media rich or media centric. It's meant for scholarship that is connected to online archives and repositories. And it's meant for scholarship that is sort of structured in innovative ways. Now, it should be said that the vast amount of scalar projects out there are not created by us or supported by us at all. It is open source, it can be downloaded, but it's also hosted. That's the version that most people use, right? It's free, anyone can register. We have about 15,000 users and probably 20,000 books. These are all the open sessions in Scalar as of like 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time a week ago. Uh, not everyone's necessarily working, but their browser is open and they're logging <coughs> to Scalar. But so you can see, right, a lot of and glo pretty global uh, usage. Okay, so given these affordances, given these aims, and given the way that we end up supporting scholars, how do they end up using Scalar, right? So here's what I like to do now. I like to kind of identify um, the genres that have sort of emerged, I think, as those most well suited for the platform, for the affordances that we built into it, given its historical trajectory and its overall aims. And while doing that, answer a couple of questions, which is, you know, why do scholars use the platform? What affordances do they use? What affordances don't they use? What do they ignore? Um, at what point in their workflow do they come to the platform? What kind of support do they need? What kind of support do we offer? You know, um, is it just training? What kind of support leads to further development, right? So not just the use cases, but the kind of <coughs> overall ecosystem in which they emerge and to which they're sort of outputted, right? Okay. So. The first compelling use case that emerged really was the, what I'll call book companion. So these were instances where a scholar had written a print monograph, typically in film or media studies, and their press obviously just didn't allow them to put you know, all the media that they would like, um, all the evidence that they had you know, um, in the print version. And so they decided the scale would be a great way to create a kind of companion that contained all of that media, right? So on the left-hand side, you see The Nicest Kids in Town by Matt Delmont. And on the right-hand side, you see um, Jason Mattel's um, Complex TV. Um, Matt Delmont is at ASU, and Jason Mattel is actually at Middlebury. So in each of these cases, um, the presses were pretty hands-off. They were excited about what the scholar was doing, right? They embraced it. Um, University of California Press in particular was excited about the idea that this companion might drive sales, to the print version. Um, and by and large, that has, I'm sure you guys have read the research, by and large, that has been the case. Uh, not just with this book. <laughs> There's no research on this book individually. Um, so both presses were uh, excited, but they were roughly, they were pretty hands off, right? So in other words, this was the scholar saying, I want to get this stuff out there. And they came to us. And in terms of support, there's a couple different scenarios. Let's, let's say that there's three different scenarios. So one scenario is the scholar knows what our platform does, and they know exactly what it is that they want to do, and there's a pretty good fit there, right? So our support in some ways amounts to the affordance is already built into the platform and maybe a little bit of training. That was certainly the case with these two, right? In other words, what they want is they want to get a bunch of media online and they want to mark it up. And it's pretty clear that Scalar does that. And so without much help from the press, these scholars grab an account on Scalar and put all the media up and write around it. And lo and behold, they have a companion. They, they, they do act somewhat differently, I, I will say. And so even within this sort of book companion genre that I'm calling it, there are some very variations. So <clears throat> Mattel's book acts more as a kind of 
archive of the film featured in the book, such that, you know, it's just like an annotated archive. So in the main table of contents, you can kind of get at the media via the chapters of the book itself, right? But you can also just go to this gallery. And so what he's done is he's just kind of, he's grabbed the analytical portions or the portions of his print monograph that analyze these particular clips and just put it into scalar, right? So again, it acts as a kind of annotated archive, I would say. Whereas what Matt has done is in some ways recreated um, a pared down version of his narrative, right? So the argument is there. The same argument that's in the monograph is here. It just has a lot more media and a lot more evidence. Right. Okay. Um, so the second use case I would say is long form argument driven work. Right. So this is a project by um, Paul Harris at LMU. And this I think not only is it a different use case, but it's also a kind of different support scenario um, in this way. So there are instances, like I just said, where the scholar just, they know what they want and they know what Scalar does and there's just a really good fit there and boom, okay. There's another scenario where the scholar doesn't necessarily know what it is that they want and they also kind of don't know what it is that scholar, what, what Scalar or the digital in general can do for them, but they really want to explore those two things, right? And in some ways, these are the more fruitful, right, support scenarios. These are the more, for us at least, the more fruitful um, engagements and relationships because this is a scholar who knows that, all they know is they can't do what they want in ink print. They want to do something else and they just want to know what the digital can do for them and Scalar in particular. So this is a scholar who had just all these writings on rocks, poems about rocks, critical essays about rocks, historical essays about rocks, all this stuff. And he just, organizing it linearly on the page just was not satisfying to him. So he came to us, what can, what, what can we do? What can Scalar do for us, for me rather? And so pretty quickly the idea emerged that well, what we would do is we would create pathways as though a reader was walking down a stone garden. And they can switch paths here and there, right? So basically, <laughs> this is what I was given. Right, this is what the scholar gave to me. This is, what, this is what I would like it to do if it could do anything, right? Um, so multiple paths that lead in different directions. It's, I mean, it ends up being a kind of choose your own adventure scholarship, right? Um, where a scholar or a reader can be on a path about poems of a particular rock and then they can switch paths, um, so forth and so on. So that's what I get and that's what I give back. Okay, this is what you want? Yes. And then that's how it lives in Scalar. So again, all that could be visualized, right? Which he was very happy about. So it isn't just that at the page level, the reader can be taken on these little narratives, right? As though they're going down paths of rocks, but they can also see the overall path. So this is, this kind of, this is the kind of scholarship that I would say is um, immersive. So in other words, these are scholars who not only don't necessarily know what it is that they want, what they do know is they want to, they want to immerse their readers in their evidence in a way that you can't do in ink print, right? These are scholars who are trying to figure out the ways in which long form argument driven work is amenable to a kind of experience um, how does one experience an argument, right? The ways in which it's amenable to um, immersion in the material, right? And the way that it's amenable to, by the way, user-directed, sorry, experiences, right? Okay. I think the same is true here. Um, so this is actually another scholar from Millbury. So um, this is a project that actually came to Stanford Press about a year ago. So many of you may know Stanford Press has a Mellon grant right now to kind of figure out um, what it would take to publish born digital monographs. Um, and in particular, what kind of human infrastructure you would need, right? What kind of acquisitions editor would you need? What kind of you know, design production person would you need? Um, and so their acquisitions editor has been kind of you know, plugging around trying to find um, 
born digital monographs to publish, and this was one of them. It was originally in WordPress, and when it lived in WordPress, it was much more of an archive. So there was section, there were, there were essays, right? And then there was a kind of archive that you could get at by filtering, right? So an archive of poems, just tons and tons of poems. And you could filter them by, you know, the same way that you would filter in, on, you know, on Nordstrom's Rack or Zappos. It's like, it's, it's database driven, right? But it's like, I want a poem that has to do with this, this, and this. Okay, and then it outputs those poems. Um, and so the complaint was that it was just too much of an archive and it wasn't an argument driven monograph. So the idea was, oh, okay, well, um, let's look for another platform. And I don't know if it was Stanford Press or it may have, may have been Alicia Peeker at Middlebury, um, who's just one of our power users, wonderful person to do, by the way, um, who pointed him in the direction of Scalar. And so the idea here is that you start with three separate paths. Uh, um, and each of those have their own trajectory. But the most interesting part of this book in terms of structure is that again, in what ways are you know, a cumulative argument amenable to a user-directed kind of experience, right? So in this case, in order to get to that archive of poetry, the reader has to recapitulate the experience that these poets in particular make when they write poems. Is it sentimental? Is it not? Is it referred to someone specifically? Right? Um, is it for public consumption? Is it not? So all the, all the sort of tacit and well-articulated decisions that these poets make in this culture before they sit down to even write a poem, the reader has to go through as a set of binary decisions in order to get to the archive of poetry or the particular part of the archive that relates to those choices. Okay, so continuing with argument-driven long-form works, I would say there's another kind of genre um, within that, a subgenre within that, um, and I would differentiate them in this sense. So the last two, um, the scholar is trying to figure out um, how <clears throat> recreating a particular experience of a set of works or an event or um, some culture is amenable to scholarship in general or to argument driven scholarship. In these cases, I think what's going on is the scholar is instead trying to figure out the way in which argument driven cumulative work is um, well suited or in any way suited to a more robust exploratory structure, right? So in other words, and it's always the same question we've been asking for 30 years, which is, can you have an argument-driven work that is hypertextually linked so much that the reader can go anywhere they want, right? So in this case, this is a set of 42 essays. This is being published by University of California Press too, by the way. Um, a set of 42 essays, um, the equivalent of like 900 pages, something ridiculous, like 800 media objects. But the idea is that from any paragraph within these essays, you can link to other paragraphs in the essays that relate to that material. You can also navigate them spatially. Um, and again, you can go from a map to a given paragraph and from a, par from a given paragraph back to a map, right? So a really robust kind of exploratory structure, maybe not necessarily below, but up in, inside of those arguments, right? And same thing here. So this is a woman who did a dissertation at NYU. Um, it was on the ACT UP movement um, in the 1980s. And so what she did was, as she was going through her research, as she was writing it up, she had pages in Scalar for you know, the people in the movement and um, you know, the, the particular protests, where they took place, um, the particular um, issues for each of the movements. Um, sorry, for you know, the, the organizations, so organizations, people, um, protest, the movement overall. And then, of course, the concepts that had kind of emerged in her, in her, in her research, right? And then she tagged them all together as they existed in the real world and also as they existed in her scholarly imagination, right? And what she gets is a vast network analysis of that work. 
And what she found was that it didn't exactly match on to what she was thinking. So there were some clusters in some areas that she didn't imagine were there, and there were some orphans in some areas that she didn't imagine were there. Right? So the point is that the author is building a database as they're building a narrative, but that database isn't just for the readers, it's also for the author, or at least it can be. right? Those relationships can reveal things about your relationship. If you're using them as a conceptual model in this way and not just as a, as a sort of navigational layer for your reader, they can reveal things that you yourself couldn't have gotten at by doing a close reading right, of the material. Okay, so uh, some short form um, argument driven work, meaning you know, essays. These tend to be a little more traditionally structured. So this is a P, oh well this is chaos and control actually, which I, I uh, showed you earlier when I was showing the annotations. This was published in an issue of American literature. Um, and I think just because they're shorter, they tend to hew to a more traditional structure, meaning they're sort of just sections, right? Um, so they tend to use paths a lot and tend to ignore tags altogether. Uh, and same thing here, this was a special issue of urban site, or sorry, special issue of urban history uh, that was all published in Scalar. So there was like five different essays um, by five different authors. And the same thing, you know, um, the authors here tend to use the multimedia affordances of Scalar, meaning they can put all the media they want in there in a particular film, um, and they create their little narratives. But uh, that's about, the, that's about the extent of the kind of affordances that, that they use with these shorter pieces. Okay, so book companions, argument driven work, long form, short form. And then I would say the other kind of use case that has really emerged is surprise, surprise, archives, right? And there are a number of different ways in which people are using Scalar to create archives. Um, and in fact, I think that um, those, different, those different uses are really starting to blend in some ways, not just in Scalar, uh, it, elsewhere I think also, uh, this has been going on for years and years, but I think with Scalar in particular, because Scalar sits at the nexus of, you know, it is at the same time um, connected directly to archives. So the work that people do in them tends to be archive driven, but it's also, you know, it's not Omeka, right? It's meant for, it's meant for narrative work, right? And so it's in some ways meant for argument driven work. So I, I think that th there's a way in which um, some of the genres that are emerging using Scalar right now kind of sit at the intersection of those two, right? Um, this I would consider to be more of a kind of traditional digital archive, um, right? Again, going back to UVA and the you know, the Dickens archive, Valley of the Shadows, right? Whitman archive, which is to say it brings together all the material from various archives that have to do with a particular event, a particular author, right? They used to be called thematic research collections, right? Maybe they're still called that, I don't know. The idea is that you bring all this material together the archive is kind of the primary object. There's some essays kind of framing the collection overall, but you're really putting it out there for scholars to use. Sometimes they were also called virtual humanities laboratories, right? The idea was that you're, you're putting this all together so that people can use them. So a number of those. Uh, this was created by uh, Will Fenton at Fordham. Uh, wonderful guy, uh, great scholar, uh, writes for PC Magazine. Oh, sorry, this is the same book. Um, yeah, so again, the, so the political cartoons are from one archive and the broadsides are from it. So it, it, it brings together, uh, it gathers together everything having to do with this particular event, right? Um, but the archive, I think, is the, the kind of primary object. On the other hand, there are what I would consider, oh, sorry, the bevels are sometimes confusing me. I'm like, is that the interface or the bevel? Um, this is what I might consider to be more of a scholarly archive. I don't know. I'm still trying to tease this out. So there's sort of, you know, there's sort of, there, there are editions and there are 
collections, meaning with collections, there's kind of a one-to-one -one relationship between an actual collection, uh, holding at an institution and the actual digital project. Then there are archives that bring lots of different collections together, right? And then there's kind of critical work, which is more inward looking, that kind of marks up the text. And then there's more um, extra textual um, work, which is relating that archive or collection to its overall historical context. And then there's more scholarly work, which is using that archive for kind of historical intervention or something. And I think those kind of 10 different elements used to there used to be critical editions and there used to be scholarly editions. And you could, they're all kind of getting mixed up and blended right now. And I think that's what we're seeing here. So this is different. I think that this has an archive. Okay, so quickly, um, these particular, it was like eight different scholars. Uh, and what they did is they grabbed about 30, about 3,000 uh, photographs from the photographer. Um, and it wasn't just all of the all of the photographs of this archive and all the photographs of this archive, all of them, they curated, right? So this was a scholarly curated you know, uh, uh, archive. It's these ones from this archive and these ones from this archive. We pull them together, it's 3,000. This is now our archive, right? This is our archive. And now we're going to write through that archive. So these are all essays that write about this particular collection. So in some ways, I think that the scholarly intervention is more the primary object and the archive that they curated sits underneath. But of course, in Scalar, it doesn't just sit underneath because you're writing through it, right? You're writing through that archive. So you know, if you're on a given piece of media and you click the citation, what we call the citations tab, you'll get that piece of media and you'll get all the different places where it's been interpreted. So the media acts as a kind of node between those different pathways. So it's an archive, but it's also, and again, not only are those genres, I think, blending and those sort of modalities blending, but I think it's also possible that when they blend, they'll close the gap between the archive and the scholarship itself, right? Um, that, so again, going back to what I was saying before, how Scalar emerged from a couple of different contexts, one of which is we wanted to take into all the considerations of the different stakeholders. So in Scalar, when you import media into your project, that media stays at the archive. We don't duplicate it onto our servers. It stays at the archive. And we did that because our archive partners were like, we don't want you, we don't want you duplicating our carefully curated copy of record, right? One. Two, the digital allows us to change the relationship between the scholarship and the archive from which it emerges, right? So always before, in print, it was like, you go to the archive, it was more of a, I don't know, like vampiric relationship, right? You go to the archive and you take and you run and you footnote it, but no one's ever gonna go back to that archive, right? In the digital, it's like, no, the reader can always be just one click away from the archive from which the scholarship emerged, right? Um, and in fact, in an ideal world, we keep talking about doing this, we just don't have the resources yet, is building a kind of round trip function where the interpretive part, the scholar's part, can actually round trip back to the archive, right? So. You know, have to be curated in some way. But the archive, so the sort of in, interpretive layer on top of those assets that are used, right, can be referenced from the archive itself. And I also think that it's possible that, you know, in, in particular in a work like this, where it may be in 10 years, well, we always say that and then it never happens. So I'm gonna say like maybe 50 years. <laughs> maybe in 50 years, it will be just as common for scholarship to exist in an archive as it does for it to be published by a press or exist somewhere else, right? Who knows? I mean, in some ways, that's, that's the meaning of libraries. Yeah. yeah. Right, they've always sat side by side on the shelf, right. but conceptually they, this just, this, this monograph is just a bunch of writing with a note here and there about this. So yeah, that's a really good point. Steel is the new library. So you, I mean, but this is also like aggregating content, right, and bringing it in. Um, so I, it's interesting how like archive becomes this term that has a certain degree of like value and, and, and prestige, whereas like if you were if you were to say like this is an aggregator, yeah, people would be like, oh, that doesn't seem as cool. I don't know. I'm just curious about how these terms are circulating and where right. you see them. Well, so frameless. So so two things. One, um, 
Aggregator, aggregator seems to imply that there's like maybe an algorithm involved. Whereas this is actually, these are curated, right? These are, they were, they yeah. were, they were chosen. Some things were included yeah. and some things were included. The other thing is that I'm saying digital archive um, and that might, I know that our, I've used this term before with, with other librarians and they're like, well, archive means that there's, yeah. a, you know, there's, there's the copy of record and then there's another copy of this color. But um, I'm using it in a very loose term. I'm using it so digital archive is kind of what people came to call these things in the 90s, right? Um, before that they were called like, hypertext archives, and, the, yeah. and then they became digital archives, right? So digital Dickens and, you know, um, the Rossetti archive and so forth and so on. So yeah. I'm just, I'm sort of using the term. Oh, that, no, I like the loose yeah. but oh, it's okay. also interesting. That, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and so that's the, and, and that's the other thing too, is not, not just how it's written about my round trip back to the archive, but also which objects did the scholars decide to put together? Why did they curate it this way and not another way? It'd be interesting for the archives to know that. Right, so again, it'd be interesting to know how they're getting aggregated in different contexts. Yeah. I should say, uh, by the way, I enjoy the question. So if, I know we're gonna have a lot of question and answer at the end, but if you have questions as I'm moving along, I'm more than happy to deal with those questions. Um, Oh, so this is just the same work, and I just wanted to show that, like, so there are the interpretive essays, but then there are also, um, you can just browse the archive itself. And just to get, you know, technical, these in scalar, these reach paths, so you just create a path of media, and then you create a top-level path, and then put it as a certain layout, and boom, all your media is there. Okay. Um, So, yeah. Could that also be done with tags? Yep, absolutely. Like if you yep, don't. exactly. And you really, so if I, if I had created 10 different tags and then put those on a path or made that a tag and then done that layout, same thing. Any parent-child relationship will display them that way. So what we saw before was um, a series of, again, I'm calling them archives, right? Which is to say someone has pulled together, the scholars themselves have done one of two things. They've either selectively grabbed things from here and there and said that this is our curated archive, which was the second case. The first case was a more traditional digital archive where they're just like, we want everything that has to do with this particular author's work, right? Whether it's Whitman or someone else, or we want all of the material that has to do with this particular topic or, or event, whether, you know, Valley of the Shadows or, um, it's another good one. Um, oh, what's the Uncle Tom's Cabin in American Culture? These are all UVA. I don't know why. That's like the only thing. Um, so same thing. It's like everything that has to do, right? And then we, and then we put it out there and we, we scholars get to work with it. This is a different genre and I think it's an emerging one. This is what I would call the digital collection. And I call it that because it's two reasons. One, it's not, scholars are not the agents, they're librarians. And two, it showcases a particular collection held by a particular institution. And I'm seeing, anecdotally, I'm seeing when I just go through Scalar's database and I'm like looking at titles, which I do, um, I'm seeing more and more of these, like the Hoover Institute, Stanford is doing a bunch of them. Um, uh, Newberry Library just did a great one on um, an exhibit of Shakespeare stuff. Um, LBJ Library. Anyway, I think that it's, it's something that um, librarians are moving more and more towards. So I think that I think they got their feet wet with um, Omeka in a way and building kind of exhibits. Um, and some of them now want to build collections that actually have some sort of, uh, have more narrative to them. So um, this is a good example. Uh, the Voltaire letter is actually at USC. Um, and so what this does is it, it does a couple of things. It is a thematic research collection in the sense that it's about trying to get this collection out there to scholars, to years and students for that matter but it's really meant to animate and showcase a particular collection by a particular institution, right? So it's less scholarly in that way, I think. It does have, they tend to have uh, essays, but those essays are more about framing the collection and talking about the provenance of the collection. Where did the collection come from? Um, how was it acquired? Um, and probably something about what does this collect, particular collection say about well, in this case, Voltaire scholarship. Like these letters in particular, what, you know, what historical interventions about the Enlightenment can be made about this collection or made with this collection or 
um, what is the provenance of this collection say about the distribution of Voltaire's writing after his death? Uh, okay, so just you know, every in this in this particular case, every letter has a uh, translation and a transcription. Um, but it is it is still a kind of hypertext document, right? With which is to say that um, so up here we have Paris is annotated, and so if you click on Paris, what you're going to get is a page on Paris, and that page is tagged to all of the letters that talk about Paris. But you can all so you can access them here, but you can also access them via a map, that sort of thing. Um, what is this? Oh, and just a timeline. That's me. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about, so the sort of, the, the, the last, I think, um, support scenario. So there are people, you know, there, there are projects where it's, they know what they want and they know what Scalar does and it's just an easy fit. And then there are the more exploratory support structures where people just, have some vague, some fuzzy idea of what it is that they want to do, and also a very fuzzy idea of what the digital can do for them, and let's find out what scholarship might look like. There are other scenarios, I think, where um, the scholars, or in this case, this is with the Voltaire project, um, faculty or staff know what it is that they want and just want to know whether or not Scalar can do it for them. Now, in those instances, I, I think that there's still some negotiation that goes on um, on a, a series of levels. One is, well, no, Scalar can't do exactly that. Um, so you have a choice here. You can either make the affordances, do what you want. You can change what it is that you want, or you can try and get us to develop something that will do what you want, right? And this is, oh, development is kind of always in the picture here, right? Um, because after all, you know, these use cases are the laboratory from which we develop out, you know, um, for the affordances. Um, and so there's always this kind of balance, both for us, meaning if we develop this for you, is it something that others could use? Perfect example, remember the, for the Stone Path project? So Scalar, you can branch paths in Scalar, but it isn't all of that legible because, I, I can't get into it, but the way the paths work, well, for, first of all, they're numbered, paths are numbered. So if you put two paths on a path, it's gonna say path one and path two. And if you're doing a choose your own adventure kind of thing, you don't want those numbered, right? You want those to be equivalent. So there's sort of, there's some cosmetic things that would prevent it from being like a true choose your own adventure. So um, when that scholar wanted to do that, we built, it, we built a small script, basically, that allows people to add metadata to a particular page and says, take that stuff out, right? Well, that then got used by the second scholar that I showed who was actually doing that with the poetry, right? Because we anticipated that that's the exact sort of thing that more and more people are going to want to do, and we were right. Okay, so there's always that balance for us. Um, for them, there's a balance of, well, if we do some custom thing because we want Scalar to do something that it can't do, who's going to keep that up, right? Who's going to maintain that, whatever it is, jQuery plugin, right? Who's going to make sure that it's always live and it's always running? So there's always an issue of maintaining your dependencies, right? Even for projects that aren't published, particularly for projects that are published, but even for, for projects like this. Okay. Um, the other thing is that uh, even though they knew what they wanted, they didn't necessarily know how it would work in Scalar. And so one of the kind of challenges that we often run up against, particularly with large projects, is there's this kind of this blockage or this melting point where scholars will get all of their material in there and then they'll just be kind of stymied because they keep hearing this mantra in their head which we're responsible for, which is you can do anything to everything in Scalar and anything can be anything else. And you can build any connection you want and everything is a relationship and nonlinear and nonlinear and nonlinear, right? And so there's this like moment where they're just like, well, then what do I do? Like, how do I even begin to structure this thing? Again, particularly in larger projects. And you really just have to, I don't know that's necessarily what I'm doing here, but um, there's a point at which you just have to say yes, you can structure it in many, many different ways and you can have interconnections between lots of different components and lots of different elements. But you'll never get, you'll never get there unless you decide what your main salient entry points are, right? 
And that's kind of what you have to do. And that's actually what we saw with the, the poetry project too, which is like those three main entry points, right? It's like the theory, the poetry, or the, the I think it was the, the, the group of people themselves. Um, those are the three main entry points. Those are the three main paths. And then within those paths, you can kind of cut across, right? Um, but I think in, with the digital in general, um, because most scholars are used to working in these kind of um, linear, cumulative ways, that there's this initial point at which they realize that if they can build this out any way that they want, they have no idea what they're going to do. And so that's where people like me and many of you, I assume, um, come in. And you just kind of have to break that down, right? And show them that, well, okay, so what are your, what are your, what are your main entry points and then where do you go from there? And, you can, you know, and, and of course, it's all iterative, right? Um, their main entry points might change, but they have to start somewhere. And so that's actually, that is what I was, I think, doing here. Um, this is what a tag looks like and this is what a series of paths looks like and this could be tagged off of this, but you gotta start somewhere, right? Okay, um, very quickly. It says I've been doing this for an hour and 21 minutes. I think that's can't be right. Not quite right. Okay. Uh, okay. Quickly. Um, we also have an API. Um, and we did this because we actually also, we did want to allow scholars who wanted to create all kind of vector Z pieces to do that if they wanted to. Um, we've had some people use it, not a lot. So what that means is basically that anyone can create, their custom, create a custom skin and use Scalar as the backend database. So in other words, if someone wants to, um, if someone wants to utilize or take advantage of that flat ontology, right? There are a lot of databases out there, but if they want to take advantage of that particular flat ontology and use it to power some piece of scholarship, they can do that. This was, I don't think this was, a, I think this was, this was not Flash, um, but the idea is, it, I, I should have done it live, but basically there's this line and you have to move the cursor kind of frustratingly and as you move it, it will open up this huge, portions of this huge mural and within there you can grab tags which tell you something um, about that particular tag. I don't even know what this screenshot is. Reagan Air, public programs are cut. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so then quickly, um, future development. So something that may be of use to some of you, we are in an NEH grant right now to build out copy editing functionality in Scalar. So I know that some of you are involved in trying to output born digital monographs. And so I assume that some of you have come up against the problem of copy editing. So um, all the stuff that we have, all the stuff in Scalar that has been published by a press to date, and this is not true for uh, just for us, it's true for Cheryl Ball at Vega and everyone from what I understand. The way that it's copy edited is that it is cut and paste into Word and then copy edited with track changes and then cut and paste back into the platform. Right, so the scholar ends up becoming the set editor, you know, the type editor, basically, right? The type setter, type setter. Um, so not the best workflow, right? So we decided that this was one of the pain points because, frankly, presses have not taken up born digital multimodal scholarship the way that we had hoped some years ago, and so we think that this is potentially one of the pain points, right? So in the next eight months, we will be building out um, an actual workflow so that each individual page in Scalar can have a different state, um, edit, edit, review, clean, so I won't go into what all those are, but you can imagine what they are. Um, and so <clears throat> each page within the WYSIWYG editor will allow you to copy, edit, and track all of those changes. And then once all those edits and author queries um, have been cleared, the page will manually be set to um, a new state, and then once everything is in a cleared state, you can then actually publish it live. We have a number of people waiting on this, um, but it is, it's, it's slow, development is slow going, especially when you have a small team. Okay, and then the other thing, so the sort of, the two big things that we're working on right now, one points towards the presses and the other one points towards the archives. So um, the importer that I showed you before, many, many slides ago, is um, 
let's say, not robust. <laughs> Basically, you just keyword search, you give an archive, it hits their API, and it spits out the results, and you can grab media from there. We're building out a much more robust um, archive importer, which will basically allow you to do a couple of things. One, create a profile for a given type of archive, right? So like if the archive is in content DM, and someone writes a profile for that and then uploads it to this open source tensor, um, everyone from then on will be able to use it and unlock all content DM um, systems, right? So forth and so on. So if, so basically it'll be profiles for given protocols, right? That people will write. Um, and we'll have a bunch already uh, in there built in. And so basically it allows you to grab media from any number of archives and create kind of playlists um, it's kind of modeled on iTunes a little bit. So you're able to create playlists of your media from various archives and then sync those playlists up with your various scalar books. Yeah? So aren't you sort of limiting yourself here by the things that are only publicly and freely available? Yes. I mean, well, there are other, you can, you can, you mean? I mean, isn't scholarship being limited in this case to things that are publicly and freely available? If you have your own digital assets, you can get those into Scalar too. Right, but you may not own the rights to those assets. Yeah, I mean, you can, in other words, let's say that you're, you're citing some article that's behind a paywall and you wanna cite it. Yeah, Scalar's not gonna circumvent those permission levels, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, we have been, we were in talks a while with, um, with uh, the Getty in particular about building out some sort of um, way for Scalar to track permission levels so that scholars could use um, media that they have access to. Um, and we just, you know, we, we have a million things that we're working on and we, did, we haven't uh, gotten to that yet, but it's definitely something that we're, that we're thinking about. Um, the other issue is, of course, copyrighted material. Um, and that's just sort of up to, you know, the, the scholar and their own kind of, you know, uh, the risk that they're willing to take and putting the media in there. But I mean, it isn't, let me put it this way, this doesn't prevent someone from citing a piece of media that they don't have access to. It just allows them to give their readers access to the stuff that we do all have access to, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't preclude them in any way from doing what they used to do. It just enables them to do many other things. It's not like someone is going to, you know, um, because they don't have access to a couple of things, not write it overall, right? Um, well, yeah, okay, so I just was showing a different, few different views of that, and then that's it, and then that's over. <laughs> and I have really gone over time, so how long do we have for questions? Is it just a one fifth? No, we've got, we've got, um, we haven't, yeah, until about 1.30, um, but so maybe we could take, um, you know, one or two questions and, uh, and then we can have a, a bit more informal conversation. We still have a bit of food here, so, um, Harry, is that? Would you talk about your relation, the relationship of Scalar with uh, publishers? Uh, I mean, I... I think I may have heard this, but maybe I didn't understand it correctly, that there are actually a number of publishers that kind of have uh, given their blessing to Scalar uh, so that you're like in a partnership of sorts. So we do, so like I said, the Alliance for Networking Visual Culture has a series of partners. Some of them are archives and some of them are presses. Those partners um, can vary in their level of commitment. So like technically NYU Press is one of our partners because they did uh, Mattel's piece, but again, they were sort of hands off. Um, UC Press has been a really great partner. So not only have they published a number of things in, uh, uh, in Scalar to date, but we're also actually working with them on the copy editing functionality. Um, they have been, they've been really committed to, um, to publishing this stuff, not only to it being open access, but to it, you know, not necessarily being housed on their servers, like all the sorts of caveats that you would normally, that presses normally have, um, they are not as wary of. So uh, they've been a great partner. Um, Stanford recently, so because of this Mellon grant, so as soon as they, as soon as um, uh, Mellon decided they were gonna publish, you know, Born Digital Scholarship, and they kind of went out into the wild looking for this stuff, what they found was that a fair amount of it was in Scalar. 
So um, we did not have a formal relationship with them like as part of the original A and B C, but we've ended up working with them very closely, and they're really open to, to publishing not just um, not just our stuff, but uh, they published a really beautiful piece called Enchanting the Desert. Enchanting the Desert, Enchanting the Desert which was. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have a chance to look at it. It's really one. It's really wonderful. Just a, a beautiful series of essays uh, with lots of lots of meaning and interesting uh, sort of uh, connections between those essays. Um, but yeah, are there people um, either conceptually from the Scalar team, how you all think of Scalar, or people using it in interesting ways? Um, are people using it to create living books or documents, or is it typically you publish your project in your book and it stays static um, forever? So I would say most people are publishing something that they feel like they can then ignore, right. like they would a book, which, by the way, is a liability. <laughs> Um, but we do have people who want to use it to create a living document. So a perfect example, we're actually working with LAUSD right now. You guys aren't from the West Coast, but Los Angeles Unified School District. I think it's the biggest school district in the United States. Anyway, it's massive, like 700,000 students. Um, their ITI, so their Instructional Technology Division, um, was recently charged with writing a report on how to better integrate um, technology in the classroom. And they want that report to be in Scalar for a couple of reasons. One, because they are advocating for more interactivity, and so they want the form to kind of match the argument, uh, but also because they want it to be a living document. And so what they've done is, and one thing I didn't mention, I probably should have, uh, so not only can you do anything to anything else in Scalar, but also you can repurpose anything in Scalar. So one annotation or one page can live on multiple paths, right? So what they're planning on doing is they're going to make the recommendations, and that'll be like a document, but then from then on, they'll be able to add to it by bringing in new people um, from the district who will then take portions of it and kind of recombine and remix given their context and where they're working from. Right. Is there a versioning system built in or something where you could see who's doing the changes and when they're making them? Well, there is a versioning system in, well, in the sense that every single page is saved, every version is saved. Right, in the database, so every time you click save on anything, that version is saved, so you can, you can revert. Um, but getting access to those versions, you can get access to the versions for individual, uh, individual pages. You can also get access to um, each individual user's latest edits. But the overall sense, meaning like the actual addition, not yet, but that is part of the copy editing functionality. So the last output is, for the copy editing thing is, this is gonna be published, right? This is edition one. And then any changes that are made from then can then be edition two. So then you could see the actual difference between the two. Um, but yeah, but there's no sort of like way to visualize the difference between those, those two versions. But there will be a way to set one and set, set the next one. Yeah. Hi. Um, I've got two scalar projects and three of mine. Uh, and, um, applying for funding for one of my projects, mm -hmm. one of the questions you get from funders is, um, is this going to remain viable? <laughs> yeah. You know, books they think of as yeah. lasting forever, yeah. but they, you know, yep. they're worried that um, digital. So I'm just curious how many of the projects that Scalar has now globally are on your server and how many are on um, uh, in independent institution servers and what is the future of the Scalar server? And, Okay, so lots of different questions there. So I'll, I'll start with the, um, our server versus other servers. So two years ago, we were kind of the only scaler. Um, we have a couple of different installations, but basically there's just the one scaler, scaler installation that everyone uses. Um, and a few people, it is, you know, it, it's open source. You can download it on GitHub. Uh, if you're technologically minded, you can do that and mess with all the configuration files and so forth. I can't even do it, by the way. Um, so a couple of years ago, maybe a few people had done that, but then Reclaim Hosting, Maybe you know if you reclaim, reclaim hosting basically made it one of their one click installs. And since then, I think I actually don't know. Anecdotally, I imagine that there's maybe 50 scalar installs out there right now. More and more, I'm noticing them um, all the time. Particularly because people email me saying, Can you reset my password? And then I go to their page and I'm like, Oh, actually, I can't reset your password. <laughs> it's actually becoming a problem because people will install scalar and then the person who installs it just kind of leaves. 
and then there's like, it's in this no man's land, so I'm trying to figure that out. But okay, so uh, a lot of different scalar installs. Um, so in terms of the sustainability of our scalar install, so it's, it's housed at USC um, on some enterprise ser level servers. Um, it's backed up every day, both locally and at the Arizona Disaster Relief Recovery, whatever it is. Um, so basically, if Los Angeles is nuked, like your scalar project is fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so in terms of sustainability, we have, uh, we have an agreement. It's going to be on USC servers in the long term. Um, and in terms of, so there's, sustain, so there's a couple of questions wrapped up in sustainability. There's, <clears throat> there's the actual data, right? Um, that will be around in the long term, absolutely. Not only that, but you can actually export the data if you want, right? So you can, you can export it as, you know, uh, um, um, RDF, JSON, or XML, RDF. Um, and you can, you can back it up and keep it on your computer. But of course, that data will have to be expressed in some way, i.e. it'll have to be expressed via the application or the platform itself. The platform, you know, because we're in a unique position where we actually do contract with presses, right? So in other words, there are a lot of platforms out there. We're one that actually has press partners. So because of that, we actually have a commitment to them to be around in the long term, and we have said so, right? Um, so, you know, 10 years, 20 years down the road, um, will we still have a team that is updating the platform? Our answer is we're very committed to that being the case. Um, uh, but you, you know, you never know. But it is open source and anyone can update it, right? So it's, it's you know, um, let's say for whatever reason Los Angeles was nuked and the scalar team went away. Um, you could, I think, fairly easily find someone to update your installation of Scalar and your publication with Duke Press 10 years down the line if for whatever reason it became interoperable with or not operable with Firefox 2000, right? Please join me in thanking Kurtz. We'll continue the conversation.